بر تو ہی محفل شاہان مبارک باشد ساقی آباد و پیمان مبارک باشد سانگز آف سیلیبریشن سچ از دس وڈ ہیو ایکورڈ ان دا گریٹ ہالز آف دا مغل فورٹس آن دا تھرٹی ایتھ آف آگسٹ ففٹین سکسٹی نائن پرنس واز بورن آفٹر اے لانگ ویٹ ٹو دا مغل امپائر نور الدین محمد جہانگیر بادشاہ دا فورتھ مغل ایمپر اپیئرڈ آن دا سین لیڈیز جینٹ پن وی آر گوئنگ ٹو بی وزٹنگ دا ٹوم آف Jahangir and his Empress Nur Jahan today. I hope you enjoy it and you are as excited as I am. So here we are in the mausoleum complex of the Emperor, the Empress and her brother Asif Khan. And we are in the outer area of the, uh, of the funerary architecture. And this is called the Akbari Sarai. Uh, it was built by Shah Jahan, but there are also reports that this might even predate this garden complex. Travelers from the Grand Trunk Road used to come here and often when they arrived in the evening, the gates of, of the walled city of Lahore would be closed. So it is in this sarai of 180 rooms where the travelers would stay the night. The Mughals were great ones for building gardens. Emperor Jahangir and his Empress Nur Jahan, in uh, his 22-year rule, built seven gardens in Lahore outside the wall. That's where the gardens used to be, used to be built, outside the, the wall of the, of the city. This particular garden was the personal property of Empress Nur Jahan and a favorite spot of the Emperor and Empress to come here. The gate behind me that you see, that is a red Jaipur sandstone with marble inlay, was the formal gate of the entrance to the Dilkusha Bagh, as this was called. And the Mughals imported Ming china, porcelain, rose water sprinklers, porcelain vases, hookah bases, and those found themselves in their architectural representation as well as in paintings. Bagh-e Bahish se hukme safar diya tha kyun? Bagh-e Bahish se حکمِ سفر دیا تھا کیوں کارے جہاں دراز ہے اب میرا انتظار کر دا کانسیپٹ آف باغ بہشت آف دا گارڈن آف پیراڈائز ہیز کیپچر دی امیجنیشن آف رولرز آف دس پار دا ورلڈ فار سینچریز اینڈ ممکنگ دا سینٹرل ایشین گارڈنس دس گارڈن دا دل کشا باغ واز آلسو ماڈلڈ آفٹر سم تھنگ کال دا چہر گلشن اور دا فور گارڈنس آف پیراڈائز And we are in the Chahar Gulshan section of Dilkusha. Where the actual mausoleum is, there was a Baradari there actually. And uh, Jahangir had specifically asked that he wanted to be buried here. The Baradari was demolished and he was buried there. The structure behind me was constructed over a 10 year period, from 1627 to 1637. Actually, Jahangir, uh, uh, in the Tuske Jahangiri, which is his autobiography, writes that he had breathing problems. He was coughing a lot. He was even coughing blood. And he had gone to Kabul and Kashmir to feel better. And on the foothills of Kashmir, uh, in October 1627, uh, he died. Uh, and uh, his entrails were removed and buried there. And his body was brought back to Lahore uh, at the behest of Nur Jahan. So Shah Jahan says that he is the one who built this. And all the histories of Shah Jahan period confirm that this is the patronage of Shah Jahan. There is a scholar called Dr. Mehreen Chira Rizvi who uh, presents a fairly plausible uh, view, a counter narrative that this was not in fact Shah Jahan's patronage of building a tomb for his father but the work of Nur Jahan. And we see that for a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, Shah Jahan and, uh, and Nur Jahan, uh, stepson and stepmother, did not get along for a variety of reasons because she wanted his brother Sharia Mirza who was married to her daughter Lardi Begin to come onto the throne. This is by far the least ostentatious and the most reserved of the four monumental pieces of, of Mughal architecture, funerary architecture as it's called. And that also leads Dr. Rizvi to conclude that given that this is not typically Shah Jahan style. So you all saw in an earlier video the tomb of Dayanga that's Shah Jahan style. You see Taj Mahal, that's Shah Jahan style. This doesn't appear to be Shah Jahan style and given the political background that I just talked about, it's very possible that this was built by Nur Jahan. 
there's a lot of Central Asian revival uh, sort of narrative that's going on here in this building. These four minarets that you see behind me with the intricate marble work in a zigzag pattern, uh, you know, that is reasonably rare. I mean, that is not seen in other monuments of uh, later on in Mughal monuments, uh, these kinds of minarets. Uh, also, this flat roof, uh, other than Akbar's and Babar's, again, flat roofs actually get uh, become dome roofs. Jahangir didn't want a dome on his roof. As you enter the tomb chamber, you will see this magnificent paintings of Mughal foliage. And we talked about Baghe Bahish, so the paradise of heaven. That is the heaven being invited inside. That's why the garden and the foliage is going inside. The tomb has got this work called Pietra Dura work, which is uh, Italian from, from Florence. It's inspired by that. So the emperor used to you know, import fancy vases and plates there for Pietra Dura. So it is a reinterpretation of the Italian Pietra, Pietra Dura in the Mughal. And according to scholars and most records on this, this is the finest example of Mughal Pietra Dura work in any mausoleum anywhere. Uh, the sides of the mausoleum also had marble that is no longer there and they would have also had uh, 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 Pietra Dura work on it. The ceiling of the mausoleum is now just sort of whitewashed. Earlier this, was, this would have had Mughal frescoes in it too. So by the time Emperor Jahangir um, comes to the royal throne, the Mughal Empire uh, is clothing over 50% of the world, feeding its own people who are generally healthy. It is five times bigger than the contemporaneous Ottoman Empire. It is 10 times bigger than Britain in terms of GDP. It has 25% of the world's manufacturing output. And Mughal exports reach all the way to Mexico via the port of Manila. And they were almost totally vertically integrated because they were not just selling yarn, they were selling muslin, cloth, shawls, carpets, leather goods, wooden goods, and often in their own ships that were being built in Surat. So it is in this economic environment that the emperor uh, comes to the throne and there is a fascinating uh, cultural environment of the imperium, cultural environment of the court. His father had already translated the great Hindu epic Mahabharata into Razam Nama by his best poets. And he had said that he had distributed to all the Amirs and he had distributed to all the princes saying, tell them that this is a gift from God. It was a must read. The life of Jesus Christ had been translated into Farsi. It was called the Miratul Quds, the mirror of the holies. That too was required reading. And so this syncretic court is what he inherited. And he continues this engagement. He continues the engagement with the Brahmins, with the Jains, with the Jesuits. But if I were to say the emperor's single biggest contribution to the Mughal Empire is to be able to create a new idiom and a new language of power and majesty, a new language of authority. And that we see in Jahangiri era painting, which is the best painting of the, of the Mughal, uh, Mughal period. We see that in court etiquette, we see that in literature, and we see that in his rule of governance. Jahangir, in my view, was the first Mughal emperor who entirely embraced Hindustan as his own. He loved the flora, the fauna, the plants, the animals, the people, the culture, the customs, the music, the smell, the fragrances, the fruit, the animals, he loved it all and he went about writing about them and having them painted by his court artists, Bechter and others, with great passion and the eye of a connoisseur. He knew he was a highly intelligent, evolved, sensitive individual who loved Hindustan. You know, the attention to detail about Jahangir has fascinated me. You know, he talks about how he, was, he had gone on a hunt to Kabul and while he was there, one of his elephants slipped and fell off a cliff. And it made a sound, he says, that kept him awake for two, day, two nights, like he had never heard a sound like that. And after much deliberation, the emperor told his retainers to push two more elephants down the cliff to hear that sound again. So there is this paradox in him. But at the same time, I'll tell you, in 1616, the bubonic plague hit India. The emperor wanted every single detail. 
which town was it going to, how was it spreading, what happened to the mice after they came out of the house, how would, they, how would you know if the mouse was infected, how long it took to die, that he ordered social distancing and quarantine. It is remarkable how open he is about his addiction problem. He talks openly about how he got started having it when he was 13, it was given to him because he had a cold. For an emperor to talk about this is quite remarkable. In 1611, when Emperor Jahangir was visiting the Mina Bazaar, which used to be a fair held in the city, allowed only for the ladies except for the emperor, he chanced upon a very attractive widow who he had known. And he seems to have seen her and fallen in love with her and proposed to her. Within that year, Meherun Nissa was married to Emperor Jahangir and became his last wife. As Empress of India, Nur Jahan had more influence and control on the Mughal Empire than any other Empress. There were coins minted in her name. She uh, issued farmans. But perhaps most importantly, the Empress had great sway on the life of the Emperor, who was incredibly uh, dependent on her as well as found in her a great partner and someone whom he could enjoy his own interests in art, architecture, flora, fauna. Upon uh, uh, Jahangir's death, uh, the Empress was confined uh, to this area. She lived here. She designed her own tomb. Uh, and we are sitting in the structure that's been designed by her. Um, and she died in 1645 outliving her husband uh, by 18 years. Uh, this tomb had uh, marble all over these domes uh, and there was uh, uh, you know, fine frescoes here. A lot of these uh, were, were taken by, uh, during Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time, a lot of the Mughal, uh, the work in the Mughal monuments was used for other Sikh monuments and this is one of them where it's, you know, it's literally being stripped bare. There are some fascinating facts about about her burial. So she is buried in a crypt beneath this cenotaph and according to sources she was in a pendulous coffin. So she was never buried underground apparently. Uh, there was a coffin studded with jewels that was hanging in the crypt downstairs and uh, you know after the Sikhs came and they, they took, the, took the jewels of the coffin that's when she was buried. So I've not understood why this is the case, why she was on a, a hanging coffin with four chains and Ladli did Begum same thing. But yes, so this started as a great love story between Jahangir and Noor Jahan. Uh, they made a great couple, they were complementary to each other but there were certainly some twists and turns as uh, Noor Jahan had her ambitions uh, um, towards uh, Sheriyar Mirza to become the emperor. As Hafiz said, that love is easy in the beginning, it gets complicated with time.